With St. Patrick's Day fast approaching, there's one saint on everyone's mind. St. Patrick, Ireland's oldest saint. But today we're here in Drogheda, outside the parish of St. Peter's, to visit the memorial to Ireland's newest saint. So let's find out more. The head of St. Oliver Plunkett is beautifully preserved in this wonderful glass case for veneration from all the faithful who come here daily to pray and present petitions to this holy Catholic Irish martyr. St. Oliver Plunkett was beatified in 1920 and later canonised in 1975. We've arrived here at the memorial of St. Oliver Plunkett and we're going to speak to the author, Tommy Burns, who can hopefully tell us more. Well, here we, here we are at the Shrine of St. Oliver Plunkett. My name is Tommy Burns, not the famous um, Celtic player. Um, Tommy Burns, um, I'm from Drogheda, um, County Loud, Ireland. And we're here in the, at the Shrine of St. Oliver Plunkett in St. Peter's Church, Drogheda. I'm a native of the parish. I was baptised here, I made my first communion here, I made my confirmation here. And I took the name Oliver uh, for my confirmation name. So. I think ever since, Oliver has held on to me. Here we have a book here at, at the Shrine, uh, written by myself a few years ago, and it tells the story of St. Oliver and his relevance as a patron of peace and reconciliation. St. Oliver was born in Loch Crewe, Old Castle County Meath, about 50 kilometres west of Drogheda, in the Diocese of Meath. And he had great association with the Diocese of Meath, although he became, later on he became the Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of Ireland. As a, as a youth, uh, he, was, he was educated by his first cousin of his mother, uh, Father Patrick Plunkett. He was titular abbot, in fact, of St Mary's Cistercian Abbey in Dublin. After the plantation of Ulster and many broken promises, the Catholics of Ireland rose up in the Confederation of Kilkenny in 1641, and they overran most of Ireland and Mass could again be celebrated in many churches which hadn't had a Mass for, for a generation or more. Oliver wished to become a priest, but there were no opportunities in Ireland to do so. It was decided that he should go to Ro Rome and there join the Irish seminary in, in Rome, the Irish College. He set off for Rome with further other young students in 1647. He was ordained in Rome on the 1st of January, 1654. When he joined the Irish College, he undertook a promise to return to Ireland after ordination. But this became impossible because in 1649, Oliver Cromwell came to Ireland and over, soon overran the country. This town of Drogheda was his first target and he soon overran it and put many people to the sword, many soldiers and people to the sword. Still unable to return to Ireland, he became a lecturer in Propaganda Fide College in theology and controversies. Oliver was selected as the new Archbishop of Armagh. Oliver returned to Ireland in 1670 to a church was, which was very disorganised and very disunited. There were rows and arguments between the Franciscans and the Dominicans, between the secular clergy and the the Franciscans, etc., and Oliver needed to restore order quickly. Alcohol was a problem amongst the priests and amongst the laity, and he soon forbade priests from um, drinking in taverns uh, or drinking whiskey. He forbade the all night wakes and the drinking at them. He founded two schools here in Drogheda, one for young boys which could accommodate 150 boys, 40 of whom were Protestant. So this became the first integrated school here in Ireland. He also found a college here in Drogheda for priests, and he brought priests from all over the northern province to educate them. Good men, but they hadn't had a sound education in the priesthood. For the first few months, he was persecuted, and he traveled around as Captain William Brown with his sword, his wig, and a pair of pistols. Being the only bishop in the northern province of Ireland, he, he got on his horse and he travelled the 11 dioceses. And over the next four years or so, he did a tremendous amount of good. The Test Act was invoked in, in the British Parliament, and this, um, I suppose, was a precursor to the penal laws. Oliver was banished from the country, but he refused and went into hiding 
and he suffered greatly, hiding in caves, in huts, in, in the forests, etc. And he wrote often about it, how much they suffered, he, the fellow bishops and the priests of Ireland at that time. For a time he lived at Ballybarrack just outside Dundalk and he ordained many priests there. So becoming Bishop, Archbishop of Armagh, uh, he returned to Ireland in March 1670 and he was arrested in December of 1679. He spent the following two harsh winters in unheated uh, prison cells. The first one in Dublin and the second one in London. He was charged um, and brought to Dundalk to face trial. But there his trial fell through because many of those who the prosecuting witnesses failed to turn up. They were wanted when men themselves and were afraid of being arrested themselves. The reason Oliver was brought to London was because of politics, basically. While the civil war in England was long over, but nevertheless civil war politics continued, particularly in the English Parliament in London. Oliver was brought to London in 1679 and was incarcerated in Newgate Prison. His trial took place in Westminster Hall before the Chief Justice of England in June 1681. The prosecution witnesses who had been paid for their troubles and would uh, have sworn black was white um, accused him of plotting a rebellion in Ireland and of plotting to bring a French army into the port of Carlingford. The opposition politicians in England were up in arms against King Charles II, particularly if anything were to happen, King Charles, his brother, the Catholic James, would then become king, and they were very much afraid of this. After his martyrdom at Tyburn, his head was thrown into the nearby fire, but was quickly retrieved by his servant James McKenna and a few prominent Catholics of the locality. We have had it out here um, every four or five years, people would come down from the museum and check that everything is in order. Um, a doctor who examined it, a surgeon who examined the relic about 50 years ago, was surprised in fact to see soft tissue still intact, particularly the marrow uh, in part of the, the spinal column. Um, you'll notice here on this side of the head that it's scorched where it was retrieved from the fire. The head was returned to Ireland about 30 years later and was entrusted into the care of the Siena sisters here in Drogheda, a new commun community of Dominican nuns, uh, whose prioress was Sister Catherine Plunkett, a grandniece of St. Oliver. It was given to them by Archbishop Hugh McMahon, the second successor of St. Oliver, as the Archbishop of Armagh. During penal times, the head was hidden at the top of their grandfather clock, encased in a beautiful ebony Emily box specially manufactured for, for it. They took care of the relic in Siena Convent for 200 years until it was transferred here to the Church of St. Peter, the Memorial Church of St. Oliver, in 1921. And here it has remained ever since. St. Oliver has become patron of peace and reconciliation in Ireland, and in particular of the Northern Ireland peace process. This perhaps began in 1979, when Pope John Paul II visited this parish. He was unable to go north of the border, which would have been his wish and his intention, but five weeks beforehand, um, Lord Louis Mountbatten and 18 soldiers were killed in separate explosions on the same day. And the north, north of Ireland was in a dire state. The first thing St. John Paul did when he visited our parish was he venerated the head of St. Oliver, which was brought out to the field that day. He then preached his great sermon of peace. On my knees I beg you to give up the ways of violence. Many thousands of people come every month to venerate the relic here.